Hello and welcome. Today I'm here with uh, Mike Moyer. He's an entrepreneur who has started a number of companies. In addition to his experience as an entrepreneur, he has held a number of senior level marketing positions with companies that sell everything from vacuum cleaners to financial data service to motor home chassis to luxury wine. He has taught in, in terms of entrepreneurship on both Northwestern University and University of Chicago. Mike is also the author of today's book, Slicing Pie, and he lives in Lake Forest, Illinois, with his wife and three kids. Hello, Mike. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. I love being talking about this topic. It's my favorite topic in the world. Cool. <laughs> and, and that's the book, Slicing Pie? That's the book. Which... There's another book called Slicing Pie Handbook that I recommend people buy more. It's, it's a more updated version of this. Okay, cool. And but basically they they bring the same um, message, um, yep. central message, correct, Mike? So yeah. uh, what's the problem with uh, equity splits, and why is it so problematic today? And therefore you had to create your own methodology, which is slicing pie. Well, the problem is that equity splits, as most people know them, are not fair, and there's no way they can ever be fair because most equity splits are based on assumptions about future events. Like, what are you gonna do? What am I gonna do? How much is our company gonna be worth? They're all based on guesses and rules of thumb and things that aren't based in reality. And the reality, the reality is things change over time and we don't know what's gonna happen in the future. We don't know who's gonna be with our company. We don't know how hard we're gonna work. We don't know how easy it's gonna be or how fast we're gonna get to break even. We don't know anything. So it's just a big risk, it's, just, it's a gamble. And slicing pie, takes this gamble, this risk, and re uh, applies a, a formula of what logic means, a logical approach to fairness. Because what fairness is, is not a matter of opinions, it's a matter of facts. And facts are observable, quantifiable things that we can see in the marketplace, where opinions are what we think are gonna happen. And unlike many areas of our lives, business is always quantifiable, we can always, reduce everything in business to dollars or pesos or euros or whatever we're working with. You can always observe the value of something in the marketplace. And because of that, we can quantify each person's contribution and use it for a perfectly fair equity split. So there's really two types of equity splits in the world right now. There's unfair equity splits that cause problems for founders down the road, and there's slicing pie. What about the formula? Explain us, what is the formula? you're talking about? Well, the best way to understand it is a game of blackjack. Do you know how to play blackjack? Yes. Let's pretend that you and I are going to play blackjack as a team. We're going to play as a team, not as, 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 as uh, opponents. And we agree to split the winning 50-50 because we're friends. Is that all right? Yeah. So we go to the table and we each put a dollar on the same hand of blackjack. We don't know if we're going to win. We don't know how much we're going to win. We don't know how long it's going to take to win. The future events are unknowable. What we can observe for sure, though, is that we each bet a dollar. So the dealer deals two aces. And in blackjack, the call is to split the aces and double down our bets. I'm out of money and you're not. So you put two more dollars down. So now you've bet $3 and I've only bet a dollar. We still don't know if we're going to win or how much we're going to win or how long it's going to take to win. The future is still unknowable. What we know for certain, though, is that you bet three and I bet one. If we win, does our deal for 50-50 sound fair? No. Should be 75 for you and 25 for me. Yeah. Our share of the winnings should reflect our share of the bets. So the formula is just as you have on the screen here. Right. The value of your bet divided by the total bets. So your three, $3 divided by $4 is 75%. That's what your share of the winning should be. That's a logical, obvious, unambiguous conclusion that reflects the reality of what we have on the table. It doesn't reflect the unknowns, it reflects the, the, the reality. So everything in business is quantifiable. And when you're contributing to a startup and you're not paid, you're essentially betting the unpaired portion, the unpaid portion of the fair market value. So your time and your money and your relationships and your supplies and your equipment and your facilities, all those things have a fair market value. If you're paid for them, it's not a bet. If you're not paid for them, it's a bet. So what Slicing Pie does is applies that simple logic to a business situation where your contributions are equal to your bets versus everybody else's bets. And that way there's always an unambiguous, perfectly fair conclusion to what your equity is.
And why in life uh, people struggle to understand that business, especially startup, early stage startups are, are bets. Uh, sometimes I feel that people don't realize actually it is if you're going to commit to lose one year of your life um, that you never get anymore in the future if you lose it. Why people struggle? I know it's a bet, makes sense, but uh, for some reason, people uh, have this misconception that it's not a bet, it's, it's, there is a, a certain level of certainty that we don't have. I think that when people start a company, <clears throat> the thrill and the optimism and the excitement of this, the startup creates this sort of magic around it. And we suddenly believe that we're magical leprechauns and we can make our own decisions and we can decide what we're going to do and we can change the world and our vision is huge as it should be. And all those things are good. You wouldn't go into startups if it wasn't optimistic and exciting and magical. But it doesn't mean you can't express values and fair market values. <clears throat> so when I take a job at a startup company and not get paid, I'm walking away from a salary that I could otherwise get paid. I'm not walking away from more than that salary. I'm not walking away from less than that salary. I'm walking away from that salary. So if I'm not paid a salary that, that reflects what I'm contributing, then I'm placing that bet. So just because I'm starting a company just doesn't make me a magical leprechaun that can touch things and have them turn to gold. It just means that I'm excited and I'm happy and I'm looking forward to the future. But you know, we're, we're faced with the reality all the time. Most startups fail, the majority of startups fail. And people know that, but they're, just, they're so overcome by the magic and beauty of a startup that they, never, they fail to think rationally. And so there are conversations like this one here. Now, who knows the value of your contribution? Who knows the total value of the firm? They're just magical made up numbers. When you think about things rationally and bring, take, it, take it out of the, the fantasy world, you know, we want the fantasy, we want the vision, we want the, all that beauty, but we, you still got to think of things in rational terms in order to make a living. Nice. And I, I work with entrepreneurs all the time, and I I, I can uh, recognize a good entrepreneur if the, they have that uh, reality distortion zone, which is necessary to big to build big things, right? Uh, but at the same time, I found your method fantastic because it's a way to deal with the reality distortion zone. Right, the methodical way. Can you explain how uh, entrepreneurs with this um, uh, reality distortion zone can uh, use in in real life? Uh, how actionable is your method, and what is the first step if uh, people want to split equity according to slicing pie? So, the first step is to realize that everything is quantifiable, and the discussion you should always have first is not one about equity and how much you're going to be worth. It's about what are the costs of the inputs. So if I'm hiring you to work for me, my first discussion should be just like you're hiring you for a real job. What's your job going to be? What's your job description? What's your experience? What's your education? And if I was going to pay you, how much should I pay you? And let's have a discussion about what the actual value of that is. If you're going to rent me your office building, I should have a discussion with you about what's the location of the building, what's the facility like, what's its worth, what's its value in the marketplace, not in the future, what's all those things? What's it, what's it going to be? If you're a salesperson, I should talk about how many contacts you have, what kind of relationships you have, and what commission structure you should expect to receive if you start generating sales for us. And think, talk about things like most businesses do in terms of what's the acquisition cost for this contribution? What's my bill going to be? What's my invoice going to be? What's my payroll going to look like? And most companies, indeed, they track expenses, they track payroll, they track, you know, commissions. There's nothing new here to track, but startups for some reason don't track these things because they're not actually spending money. So the first thing any entrepreneur needs to do is say, we got this magical vision. Now to get there, we got to get contributions. We got to pay for these contributions. The way we're going to finance ourselves, the way we're going to pay for these things in the beginning is by not paying for them. So by understanding how much we're not paying, we understand what's going to be what's put at risk. And if I pay you, we're even. So if you're worth $100,000 a year and I paid you out of my pocket $100,000 a year, I don't owe you any equity whatsoever because you're not taking any risk. And indeed, most people have jobs where they go to work and for their employer and they get paid and they don't take equity. But if you're not getting paid, that I, I got to cut you on the upside on the, on the outcome of the bet. And that's where slicing pie comes in. It just says, manage your business like a smart, rational, financially adept manager, and then pay people what they deserve. If you can't, for whatever reason, pay them, then use slices in the pie. If you have enough revenue to pay them, then you'll use revenue to pay them. If you have enough investment to pay them, you have, you'll use investment to pay them. If you don't have neither of those things, then you'll have to use slices in the pie. And a slice, by the way, is part of the formula. It's a, it's a, it's a unit of risk. It's just like a bet, like a poker chip. 
So I, I use the term slices to track how many how many people's bet are relative to one another. Right. And I want to emphasize that uh, Mike's book or both books was Slicing Pie and Slicing Pie Handbook. Uh, inside the book, there is uh, all the details anyone uh, can can learn about how to bring this uh, your contribution to, to the actual market value and, and fit into the slice of the pie. Correct, uh, Mike? Yeah, I mean, the, the there, basic is... There know, are many the, different the, ways to do that, right? It's not a... There aren't many days, but yeah, it's just, it's just you observe the fair market values and apply the model. Now, the thing is that there's not, there's no such thing as more than one version of fairness. There's only one version of what's fair. If you have an mm -hmm. idea of what's fair and I have an idea of what's fair, one or both of us has to be wrong because right. you can't have two versions of fair. It's either well, we fair have to or agree it's not. on that, right? Yeah, right. So it must not be an agreeing, agreement of what. Right. Uh... It's much easier to agree to what our fair market value is. It's much easier to agree to how much this mouse costs than it is to agree on how much the future value of our company is going to be or what your future contribution is going to be. Right. This, this remind me, uh, Marshall Rosenberg, uh, non-violent communication where you agree with other people about uh, the state of the emotion and how you judge people. And on your method, you agree on how you judge fair market values, right? And so the, the, the whole system becomes less violent, right? You want to talk yeah. about violence. What about the alligators? Yeah, so the alligator, alligator pits. We have the less, we have the, 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 the greater than sign and the less than sign. You know, when you go into what I call a fixed equity split negotiation, most equity splits are fixed. We go in 50-50, we go in 60-40. We set, we fix the, 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 the equity share up front. And when that happens and things start going different than we thought they were going to be, someone's going to have more equity than they deserve or someone's going to have less equity than they deserve. And the emotions we bring to the table when you negotiate those things are, you know, get as much from myself as I can, get out of there. It's it's, it's a it's a head-to-head -head conflict about how much equity we get. Indeed, 60 to 80 percent of all equity splits wind up in dispute that require legal intervention. That means you're probably going to have to hire a lawyer to solve your disputes. So like all those alligator pit negotiations, it's like being in an alligator pit trying to fight your way out of it. What Slicing Pie does is avoid the alligator pit and say, let's just start a company, see where it goes, keep track of our contributions, and the equity split will be fair no matter what choices we make, no matter who comes or leaves or how much you work or how little we work, it always will work out in the end because we're tracking the logic of contributions and we're making decisions based on our good management skills and our financial uh, understanding. Nice. And uh, what happens after you you split you you split the, the equity? You define what is the the um, the uh, current market value of each one's share. What's next? Uh, what can happen next? So slicing pie accumulates slices in exchange for bets on the table, in exchange for unreimbursed expenses or unpaid salary or commission, things like that. Over time, the company will start getting cash in the door, hopefully, that's the idea, right? So if it generates revenue, you can use those revenues to pay those commissions and expenses and salaries instead of slices. Or if you raise series A investment, you can use that cash to pay people's expenses and, and salaries. At that point, the pie naturally stops accumulating slices. So the pie stops growing. And we know what, and our bet is complete in the sense that we're no longer betting anymore. We're using the company's money. So at that point, the pie, the pie bakes or freezes and turns into regular equity shares, common shares, or however you decide to do it. Now, that being said, venture capitalists that invest in your money in your company may impose new rules and restrictions on those shares, like reverse vesting, um, things like that. But the team got to that point as a team treating everyone fairly, and they know what their split should be at that point. And then when you bring new people in, you pay them a salary or commissions, whatever their fair market salaries are. And equity can be used as a you know, bonus program You using the base price of the equity. So if I know that it's a dollar per share, I can use that as part of my bonus program. But slicing pies you use during the bootstrapping stage when the value is assumed to be zero and there's no basis for, for doing the math. So we have to use relative value of the bets instead of the actual value of the shares because it's the actual showers, shares or value of the shares is unknowable. Uh, and and have, you, have you seen uh, any startups or, or entrepreneurs with this slicing pie cap table uh, model? What is the, the impact of that on the, the investment decision from funds and investors? They, they like that. So what Slicing Pie delivers is a clean, conflict-free cap table that's fair. That's what investors want. 
They want to look at your cap table and say, there's no conflict here. It's logic. We're not going to have to deal with normal with, with future legal disagreements. We don't have debt equity, which are people who don't work for the company and don't like you anymore. So the cap table that slicing pie delivers is clean. Now, major investors don't participate in slicing pie because it's, it's they're providing the cash to, to pay everybody. So they don't necessarily care where this cap table came from. They just care that it works. I've never in my past 10 years of doing this heard a single situation where an investor looked at the startup and said, oh, we're not going to invest in you because you applied logic and formulaic process to your cap table, so we're not going to invest. That's not a thing people would say. They would say your cap table is a mess because you didn't use slicing pie, so we're not going to invest in you because you got a bunch of absentee owners and you owe shares to people. And you know, I've seen some pretty ugly cap tables. Um, but slicing pie doesn't deliver the kind of cap table that an investor would be scared of. And what about uh, legal issues? Uh, do you have any any information about slicing pie being used in other other countries like Brazil? How can people uh, adapt to the laws, local laws? What are the major issues with that? So, so at its core, slicing pie is a way to make better decisions. So when you go into a fixed equity split, a 50-50 split or a 60-40 split, you're making a decision. And that decision, whatever went into that decision isn't legal or illegal. You just made up your mind somehow. So slicing pie just gives you the right choice, the right choice to make. Now that being said, different countries have different laws on how things can be managed, and it's it's useful to to bake slicing pie into the agreements that you have in place, so no one's no one's mis, you know confused. There's no new taxes. There's no new problems introduced by slicing pie, other than the fact that things will change over time, and all startups change over time. If we do a 50-50 split, things are going to change over time as we may add somebody or somebody leaves. The things always change, but slicing pie just gives you the logic to make the changes. The slicing pie has been translated into about 10 different languages. It's been used all over the book, all over the world. I have lawyers in dozens of different countries. I even have a slicing pie operation going on in Iran. So even in different economic situations and different uh, you know, government situations, the model always applies. It's because it, it reflects the logic of what's fair and not my opinions. It's not Mike Moyer's you know, you know, impression of how this should work. It just simply reflects how logic works in the real world. That's why slicing pie is free to use. You know, I don't own logic. I just express logic in a way that makes sense. Okay, what about in your book, you talk about uh, uh, time tracking, which is uh, the, 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 an area where most entrepreneurs struggle. Uh, how do you have any tips for time tracking? Yeah, so you do have to track the inputs to slicing pie. Um, but you would track time or, or other expenses the same way that you would track them as if you were paying them. So if you want to hire a salaried employee and pay that person monthly, that's how you would track their time. If you hired a consultant, you want to track, pay them hourly, that's how you would track their time. So you just are tracking things people track anyway. Most companies track their payroll. Most companies track their expenses. There's an expense report process in most companies. There's nothing new or burdensome here. It just you're just keeping track of things that you didn't spend versus things you did spend. Now, a lot of startups don't track those things because there's no cash changing hands. But by not tracking them, they don't ever get a clear picture of what their cost structures are. So I'll have companies that have been around who still say, oh, we, can, we can undercut the competition by 50% because our cost structures are so low. Well, you, they're not low. You're just not paying for your rent, paying for your employees. Maybe. So paying for things and knowing what you should pay is just kind of a, a basic process of, of startups. If you don't have the wherewithal to be able to track your payroll and expenses, you're not going to get too far with uh, your company in the first place. So it's good. the points may not matter. But uh, for the most part, tracking is always perceived as an issue, but in practice, it's not. And slicingpie.com has software you can use to track your contributions over time, whether it be time and materials or equipment or facilities or supplies. People can just type in what they've done. Yeah, one thing I read on your book and I really like is, is the fact that uh, if someone is resisting to, to implement a fair equity split, it means you should not do business with them, right? Or not having as your co-founder because there is something wrong with that person's mindset. Right. So, I mean, what I found is there's three reasons why someone wouldn't want to use slicing pie. The first reason is they don't get it. They've heard this video, they've seen, they've read the book, it just hasn't clicked yet. Once it clicks, you'll see that it's just, it just reflects basic logic. The second reason is they don't want to learn it. They just don't want to bother learning something new, which is fine, but that's not the kind of person you want to work with anyway. And the third reason is that like you said, they do get it. They do understand that it's fair, but they don't want to be fair. 
They have an intent to take advantage of you. And I see this a lot with startups where, where investors will see a, you know, a, a, a lot of potential and they want to get as much as they can. Uh, you know, just look at Shark Tank. They're just trying to cut these deals that are just weird. Um, so if someone doesn't want to be fair, that means it's their intention to take advantage of you. And I've personally worked with partners that have deliberately took advantage of me because they know that they could get away with it. And just because you signed something and just because it was legal and just because you can get away with it doesn't make it fair. Like in Blackjack, we had a deal for 50-50. I could sue you and then probably win that lawsuit because we agreed to it. That doesn't make it fair though. What's fair is that slicing pie tells us the answer. So once you're faced with the answer, your choice not to follow the fair choice just means you're not a fair person. And if you're not a fair person, then you'll fight it and you want to you know, be careful of those folks. But if you are a fair person, you'll say, yeah, this makes sense and this is what we're going to do and that's that's only fair. So uh, in most cases, people are, are, are open-minded to that and they want to do what's right. Nice. Now, can you, can you help now our viewers uh, who don't get it? So how can you help them to pitch slicing pie model to somebody else, maybe their co-founders? Give us a tip here. Well, the, the best analogy that I use is that blackjack game example. When you describe the game of blackjack, when you know you have three coins on the wall, three chips on the on the on the three dollars on the table, and I have one dollar on the table, there's no ambiguity, and people can realize that they, they, if they're not getting paid, they're placing bets, and that analogy really works. I actually didn't make that up; it was came from one of my users who described it back to me that way a few years ago, and I liked it so well, it was so easy to hear that that's kind of the best way to do it, but this whole idea that we have a fair market value is always a good place to start with someone. I always find that people are resistant to set the fair market value. Like they'll say, I'm an advisor. I don't want to track my time. I'm worth, I'm worth so much to you. You couldn't have the business without me. You know, that's true for everything. So you got to really nail people down for their fair market values and really negotiate that fair market value. So you'll have a, have something concrete to, to, to go with. I have a sailboat and on my sailboat, there's a cord that holds the mast to the back of the boat. And holding it together is a little pin that costs about $4. Without that pin, the entire boat doesn't work. <laughs> you, you can't sail the boat. You can't go anywhere. You can't use the boat. It falls apart. But that pin costs $4. So you could say one, one way it's worth the entire value of the entire boating experience. And the other way you could say it's worth $4. It's worth $4 because I can throw it away and get a new pin and replace it. Yeah. So you got to think of things in terms of ration. What am I actually putting in there? I'm putting a $4 pin in place. Now, I'm an important part of the boat, but any part of the boat removed, for the most part, could be, could say you, could be uh, you know, could destroy the value of the boat. So, you know, you can't say I could take the toilet out and the boat would still work, but I don't have a toilet, so it's not as nice. There's all kinds of things that you, you can make argument. That's not a rational argument. The rational argument is, what's the fair market value of this contribution? Was I paid for it or was it a bet? And that's that's the best way to start for it. Um, I have free, you know free guides online that you can download and give to people. Uh, there's like, certainly tons of video content. You know my goal in life is to explain how this works because once people get it, it, it makes perfect sense. And I, I personally don't see people's point of view when they come at me with a fixed split. I I just can't get my head around the old way to do it. It just makes it. It's just I I don't get why people would want to do it that way when, when it's so easy to apply slicing pie and make sense out of it. And uh, tell about your your uh, software, your the app. How how does it work? And can can people track the slicing pie model on on a spreadsheet? How how does it work? And so there's a spreadsheet online you can download from slicingpie.com that I created years ago to help people track it. And you can just basically open it up and track individuals. I call them grunts. And tell, you know, tell about the what, is, what are grunts? Grunts are people who do the hard work of you know they do the grunt work, the hard work. It's a, it's a it's a term that comes out of the American military, the people who do the hard work. Um, but it, people said to me, "Gosh, you should make an app out of this." So I did make an app out of it, and you know some things are sort of nuanced, um, and how you track things. For instance, you know overtime and and uh, tracking personal expenses like car expenses. You know you you track, you know actual mileage you just so things like that that just kind of kind of helps you keep track it also helps to keep keep a register a log of all the contributions that were made so when it comes to due diligence or double checking what people did it's really easy what's also important is when you separate from someone there's logic that applies when you separate from someone 
when someone leaves a company, that's often the most disruptive time in the uh, company's experience, you know, the founder's experience. You got to get that equity back if you can. And the slicing by software helps apply that logic. For, exa for example, there's four reasons why you can leave a company. You can be fired for good reason, which implies you weren't doing your job. You can be fired for no good reason, which impl implies that you were doing your job, or I just fired you because I wanted to. There's being there's resigning for good reason, which implies that I made promises you didn't that I couldn't keep, like I changed your job or I changed your salary. And there's resignation for no good reason, which means you resigned for your own reasons, meaning you just wanted to quit. If you're fired for good reason or you resign for no good reason, you would lose your bet. You're walking away from your bet. Just like a solo entrepreneur walking away would lose everything, you would lose your bet in the slicing pie model. Whereas if you're resigned for good reason or you're fired for no good reason, you, your bet stays on the table, subject to fear, further dilution, but your bet stays on the table and converts to everybody else. That reflects the logic of what's going on. So there's consequences, logical consequences on what decisions you make. So the software helps track those kinds of things and make it easy for people to be to see what's going on and have some transparency through the whole process. So it covers you in case of uh, well, uh, events like the ones you describe happens, which are pretty common events in, yeah. in a startup, especially, right? If people want to leave, is it fair? It's, it's not. Can you share a case, maybe from one of your users or companies that you advise um, where they actually use this license pie and how it was the experience? Well, one of the most popular things people say to me is, I wish I had learned about slicing pie years ago because it would have saved them a lot of headaches in the four previous companies. Um, and that's when, they, and just, and when people come to me at that point, I do, you do what's called a retrofit and you can retrofit slicing pie to, 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 to replace your, the problems you face with your fixed split. But you know, it's very difficult for me to track individual case studies. I do have some cases on, on my website. One of my favorite stories is a guy who had an idea for a Amazon web services service that he posted to Reddit and he met someone who was interested in working with him on it. And so as they never met in person, they just started using slicing pie and started meeting online. And they, six months later, when they first met in person. So they used slicing pie to work with a complete stranger with, and slicing pie made it possible for them to, to, to continue and succeed and make a business. Um, that kind of thing shows you that, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't have to know who somebody is necessarily, as long as they're working well together, then you work well together and things are great. If things don't work out, slicing by has a remedy for that. So no matter what happens, no matter what, what the outcomes are, slicing by always self-corrects for what happens and it's always logical. Nice. Uh, Mike, uh, thank you so much for sharing all that, that knowledge here with us, with the Brazilian viewers. I'm, I'm really sure that we're gonna use a lot of slicing pie in brazil from now on because brazil it's uh speeding up towards uh startups innovation uh, the economy is growing i'm sure you're gonna hear a lot about brazil you're invited to come here many times and uh, i'll leave with you the last uh, moments uh, to share the last message and and leave your contacts and tell people how to get the book or or the site we have the website down here so with you. Sure, well, thanks, Evan. My website, of course, you can always reach me on my website, Mike at slicingpie.com or slicingpie at, at slicingpie on Twitter. You know, the main message is slicing pie reflects a universal understanding of how fairness works. And it's not my tricks, not a bag. It can't, it can't be gamed, it can't be beat, it can't be dismantled. It is what it is, just because what's fair is fair. If you and I are brothers and our dad gives us a cookie and says, split it up, boys. There's only one way to split that cookie that's fair. You split it in half. There's no other way to do it. If you bought the cookie with your own money though, then you don't have to give me any of the cookie. It's only it's fair that you can eat the whole thing. Now, if I stole your half the cookie, my greed doesn't make it more fair. If you give me your half the cookie, my your generosity doesn't make it more fair. There's only one version of what's fair. And once people realize that, and once people realize that all we're doing is reflecting back what our culture worldwide thinks is fair, then it'll, you'll realize that it always works. So trust in the model, it always works. I've never once seen it fail. As long as you apply it properly, it always works. Thank you, Mike. Thanks so much. Appreciate You're that. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you.